Well, yes and no. Guess I gotta explain myself a bit further on that, don't I? When you have a successful property, it makes complete sense that you'd want to try your hand at expanding it to a multimedia franchise. To see how else you'd be able to milk it for all it's worth. This can be done through comic books, toys, and of course one of the most lucrative avenues, video games. I talked about it briefly a while back in my Nicktoons Unite video, but one of the sad things about video games getting so much bigger and better over the years is that it sorta of killed the concept of licensed games. Back in the PS2 and GameCube era, these were everywhere. You got your Nicktoons games, Despicable Me on PS2, now that's a cla- Ugh, what is that? And of course, the magnum opus of my collection, B-Movie Game. I adored this as a kid. But stuff like this isn't really made anymore, at least not on this scale. You'd be lucky to get a mobile app at this point. I think this is because people are a lot more cautious about what they want to spend their money on, and with reviews and YouTube being so readily available, it's easier than ever for a consumer to see that buying Nickelodeon Car Racers 2 probably isn't the best investment. So companies have really been needing to up their game when it comes to licensed games, to warrant folks wanting to buy it over the new Triple S shooter. The most recent one I can think of is the new Samurai Jack game, that was a 3D hack and slash I'm pretty sure. I heard it was alright so I'll have to check it out sometime. Anyway, I loved these sorts of games when I was growing up. If you were to look at my PS2 collection, you'd think I was insane because licensed games consist of about 75% of it. Because how could Garfield 2 the video game possibly be a bad idea? I'm not really sure why I fixated on these so much. It was probably something as simple as seeing a recognizable brand and wanting it because of that. Like when you see a gummy burger, two cars, but when you stick a Spongebob sticker on that, yes, I'll take 10. We'll take 20. This isn't always the case though. Sometimes a good licensed game or two can slip through the cracks. And hey, some of them are even considered great and must-haves for the console generation. Like Spider-Man 2, Spongebob Battle for Bikini Bottom, and of course one of the most highly praised licensed games of all time, The Simpsons Hit and Run. But before we get into talking about The Simpsons Hit and Run, and whether or not it's actually overrated, you know all this talk of video games has reminded me of this amazing, new high quality game that fits right in your pocket. You've probably never heard of it before, it's just a little known game called Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is one of the biggest mobile role playing games of the year, and it's totally free. Whether it be for its detailed models, environments, addicting gameplay, or smooth and impressive animations or it's 500 champions to collect, each with their own skill trees, and millions of artifacts to find and equip, so no two champions will ever be the same. That makes for literally trillions of ways to build your teams, crazy depth, and endless strategies to figure out. Now if that doesn't sound epic, I don't know what does. I personally chose Kyle. Ka Caillou? Kyle, Because of his AoE attacks, and these magic characters to me are just pretty rad in general. Or should I say pretty read in general? <laughs> There's this new Artifact Forge update that lets you craft items directly, as well as a whole new advanced quest system with epic rewards, along with new champions and this cool looking Doom Tower seems to be coming soon, which I'm super excited about. You can find me in the game under Butch Hartman, so if you're quick enough you can even join my clan. So what are you waiting for? Go to the video description and click on the link to receive 200,000 silver and one free champion, and not to mention all this treasure waiting for you. So install Raid for free on iOS or Android devices. It's also on PC using the link in my description, and get a special starter pack available for the next 30 days only, and only for new players. So anyway, about these Simpsons. There are people who unironically call this one of their favourite games. I usually see it pop up on best games on the PlayStation or GameCube lists, and to this day it's still held in a generally high regard. Hell, it even has a pretty active modding community that still releases new content for the game to this day. Why is that? Is it nostalgia? A general love of the Simpsons? Or is this game really that good? Well, I actually grew up playing Hit and Run. It was one of the first games I got for my PlayStation, along with LEGO Star Wars and Smarties Meltdown. I would play it all the time. Not even doing the story, simply just driving around and exploring Springfield was fun to me. But then again, I was like seven. Maybe looking back, the game won't be anywhere near as good as I remembered it. Again, I, I had Smarties Meltdown on that list. I clearly did not have very high standards. So with potentially destroying one of my few pleasant childhood memories, let's look back at The Simpsons Hit and Run, to see if it really is that amazing, or if it's just simply overrated. So The Simpsons aren't new to video games. Earning its first episode in 1989, and becoming an overnight success, The Simpsons was in the perfect place to be adapted to games, with the success of consoles such as the NES, Mega Drive, and arcades in general. We had such classics as Bart vs. the Space Mutants, Bart vs. the World, Bart's Nightmare, noticing a trend here, Sadly, most Simpsons themed video games were not received very well, with poor controls, confusing gameplay. The only one I hear any real praise for is the Simpsons arcade game, which looks pretty fun. And this trend continued into the advent of 3D, with gems like Simpsons skateboarding, which I also had the misfortune of owning as a kid. 
Thankfully, though, in 2001, Radical Entertainment received the rights to develop some Simpsons games, and we were graced with Simpsons Road Rage, which is a pretty decent crazy taxi knockoff. It let you drive around Springfield picking up characters from the show and dropping them off for money. It's not amazing, and it gets pretty repetitive, but again, it was fairly decent for what it was. Horrible graphics, though, why is the Simpsons house pink? Please kill me. That poor man. I hope someone does kill him. After this, Radical went on to create their next game starring the world's most famous family, and since Sega caught on to them last time and ended up suing them for ripping off Crazy Taxi, maybe it's time to branch out from Road Rage and try something more original. Or you could just rip off Grand Theft Auto, that's cool too. Radical gave the game engine a complete overhaul. I guess you could say the change was... Pretty comprehensive. One major feature that would separate this one apart from Road Rage was the ability to actually get out of your vehicle and explore Springfield, being able to visit stores and locations from the show, or platform on rooftops or inside the power plant. Now Springfield is a big place as seen in the show, and has a ton of characters, so how well were they able to execute this? Well let's start with the story. The game is split up into seven different chapters, and while at first this seemed completely disconnected with the characters after different goals, they quickly start to intertwine, and follow along a singular narrative. Just with like 50 more smaller narratives going on in a chapter. It starts off by establishing a brand new soda called Buzz Cola. As we follow Homer driving around Springfield doing his everyday tasks like going to the Cookie Mart, going to work, and destroying Smithers' car. You know, just like in the show. This is until he starts to investigate these mysterious black vans appearing around Springfield, who he assumes belong to Mr. Burns, who's trying to spy on the residents. So after sleuthing around for a while, he confronts Burns, turns out after all they were just pizza vans, Homer gets fired, and we move on to Bart. Bart wants a new video game Bonestorm 2, but some crazy lady destroyed all the copies, which turns out to have been Marge who helped you in the Homer campaign. So because of this, he figures the next best thing is to help Professor Frank finish his giant truckosaurus robot. Because hey, that's a logical progression. After he helps Frank through a series of fetch quests, he goes in to see Truckosaurus, remembers he's a 10 year old and probably shouldn't be near a fire breathing robot, and leaves. Aliens. Yeah, all the stuff I just mentioned adds nothing here, he's just, he just gets abducted. On to Lisa! It seems not even Radical liked Lisa or knew what to do with her, because her entire campaign is also centered around Bart. With her investigating around Springfield to try and look for him, she eventually, and I mean eventually does, but alas, his mind has been scrambled. Enter Marge! Marge sets out on a quest to find out what happened to Bart, and after searching around Springfield and looking into crop circles, Grandpa informs her that the crop circle looks exactly like the Buzz Cola logo, so she gives him a can and now he's cured. He informs her that the cola is a mind control drink created by aliens as we play the next chapter... Maggie. A... a poo? Oh, Alright, I guess this game just hates fun. Apu also gets involved in trying to investigate the cola, and Tim and Bart manage to track down its origins to the Springfield Museum, where they find out the source of the cola is a meteor. They then manage to find an eavesdrop on Kang and Kodos, where it's revealed Earth is just a reality TV show, and to make it more interesting they're trying to make everyone crazy through the power of cola, and then proceed to give them laser guns to draw in viewers. Remember, this game's opening mission is going to the store to get ice cream. This is also where my game crashed at the most perfect point while streaming it last year. You get a lot of really interesting ideas. Um, like there was this one uh, Wait, what, called... So, Dr sorry, I think hmm? my, did my game freeze? Did it? Because Apu is now too scared to help, Bart gets assistance from Homer, but their efforts are futile as the cola is released into the water supply and seeps into the ground, which ends up releasing the undead from the cemetery, you know, like ghosts, witches, and pirates, the usual stuff found in a graveyard. Finally, things come full circle as for Homer once again, who thanks to the help of Professor Frank sucks up some nuclear waste into the alien ship, which blows it up and Springfield returns back to normal. Now, I'm not usually one to take a game or movie and go through the story beat by beat, and to be fair, I skipped over a lot of stuff in there that ultimately leads to nothing. But I think an extensive overview like that is almost necessary to explain how bizarre this story is. Like, it starts relatively normal, then just nosedives into absurdity. As a kid, the furthest I got into this game was the Apu level, yet it took me years to actually comprehend that this story is about aliens invading Springfield. I don't know if that says more about me or the game. It's not much of a complaint though, the story is clearly not something that I wanted to spend much time focusing on here. You'd be lucky to get like, two cutscenes per campaign. Lisa doesn't even get one. And I can overlook how non-important the plot is because of how entertaining all the characters and dialogue are. One of the biggest aspects I wanted to promote with this game was that it was written by the actual Simpsons writers and voiced by the real cast. It's even on the back of the box. 
Seems like it's the sort of thing not worth mentioning, but for licensed games, it wasn't as common back then as it is now. Well done, SpongeBob! Now, how's about giving old Mr. Krabs that shiny gold? I'll give you promotion! And they did a great job with it here. This game can be really funny. Not only with the Simpsons family, but they've also got most of the steeple secondary characters too. We also got their own standout missions where we get to hear them make their funny quips. I gotta get the new Bone Storm or I'll be as uncool as Millhouse. I'm standing right here, Bart. Hey, hey, that's great. The only aspect of the writing that I could see getting on someone's nerves is how much the characters talk during gameplay. You do anything in this and they've got at least four things to say about it. Simply just walking around is enough for them to make some kind of quip. I say someone's nerve because that is not a complaint I have at all. Maybe it's nostalgia talking, but I love every one of these catchphrases, and it doesn't bother me having to hear them for the hundredth time. I take it over the characters not talking at all. It really helps bring you into the immersion of the world, sort of like Sonic Heroes and how characters will always have something to say about each scenario. I don't care that Teals is telling me it's Eggman's robots for the millionth time, nor do I care about Bart crashing his car and crying about his ovaries. Oh, my ovaries! This is the part of the video where I remind you of my friend's Sonic channel that you should check out for more videos very similar to mine. Are you tired of this joke yet? It can also be very meta, like the opening that parodies basic video game tutorials and how they can seem like they're talking down to a player. And the B button is your handbrake. You know, just like every driving game ever. But that's all commenting on the story and writing. I think there's a more important aspect to a game than that. The music. This game's soundtrack is amazing. I love just about every song. There's no reason why this game's OST needed to slap so hard. Like, you can't sit there and tell me you don't find it hard not to dance along to the classic song, Car Selection. I also love that they try to do the little transition stingers like in the show. Whenever you enter and exit buildings, that's a great attention to detail. It sounds like it was ripped right out of the show, but it is so high energy and whimsical that it gets you right in the mood to get in your car and do some missions. Oh yeah, the gameplay. Like I mentioned earlier, instead of ripping off Crazy Taxi, this time Radical have aimed their focus on ripping off Grand Theft Auto. This seems like a pretty natural evolution from the gameplay of Road Rage. With the cars being given a bit more weight to them since in Crazy Taxi you can fly all over the place with a goddamn speed of sound. The cars control great. It's the perfect blend of realism and cartoony physics that make it fun to race around with. Grand Theft Auto V is a lot of fun to play, but a part of me sort of prefers how vehicles controlled in Vice City and the older titles. You know, just because it's more realistic to how an actual car drives doesn't automatically make it better, and then knocked it out of the park and hit and run. Sadly though, the same cannot be said about how you control outside of the car. For the most part it's functional, but there are a few sections where you're expected to platform and the controls just were not designed for that, it's near impossible, especially near the end of the game. It's unfortunate that this is how you're going to be doing most of the optional stuff in the game, like getting the collector's cards scattered around the map, which are all references to the show. I'd love to see all these, and you get a 3D itchy and scratchy short as a reward for collecting them all, but alas, that would require dealing with this game's on-foot controls. This is also how you'll be taking on the exciting and creative enemies you have to face off against, such as robot wasps and... Robot wasps. What were the point in including these? I get they're the spy cameras, but they just seem so random and each campaign only has like seven of them in very specific places, so coming across them is very rare. Again though, this is not much of a complaint since you are rarely made to get out of the car. More often than not, you're just asked to get out and talk to someone for your next mission, and the cars are just so fun to ride around in that I could care less about the running sections. And having the ability to drive around one huge Springfield map is amazing. They weren't able to fit one giant Springfield into a single map because of memory constraints, so we're given three completely different maps, all taking place within a different part of Springfield, with plenty of noticeable landmarks from the show. Whether it be the suburban neighborhood with the Quickie Mart, Elementary School, and Mr. Burns Manor, the town center with the Mayor's Office, Moe's Tavern, and Monorail, or the final and biggest map which seems to focus on the entertainment district of Springfield, with the Aztec Theater, Duff Brewery, and Krusty Lou Studios. I actually like the fact that it was split up. They're big enough as is. If these were all part of the same map, it'd be a pain to travel between. Think of the fuel costs, especially in this economy. The game is also great in terms of fan service. Other than the cards, each location also has a series of gags you can find throughout the map. It's exactly what it sounds like. You walk up to it, push a button, and there we go. Funny joke time. Then there's the cars themselves. They put a ton of effort into making each vehicle stand out, as all the ones you switch between are references to vehicles seen in the show. 
Of course, you can ride the classic family sedan, but there's also Bart's Honor Roller or Malibu Stacy car, the car built for Homer, and my absolute favorite being the Speed Rocket, which you can find outside the Gold Mansion, which is incredibly fast, but if you so much as scrape it off the side of another car, it's blowing up. Wait, so... This sounds great, you say to me through the computer screen, and to that I say, you know I can't hear you, right? This game seems like it has everything. References to the show, fun gameplay, funny writing, and you'd be correct. Everything you just said is completely true. But looking back, there is just one thing that bothers me about this game to no end. It's very tedious. This isn't an original thought by any means, but this game is bogged down so much I think by its monotonous mission structure. There are like seven types of missions in this game, if I'm being generous. And quite a few were just slightly different takes on the other types. Like this time, instead of racing against a time limit, you're racing against another driver. How different! There's the one where you have to ram into a car to grab the collectible, race to a location to grab the collectible, run around the map to grab all the collectibles. Seeing a pattern here? Then there's the one where you have to follow a vehicle closely. Or the one where you have to get as far away as you can from the car. Then there's the one where you actively have to ram into and destroy the car. It's just all very seamy, and you'll have experienced a majority of these missions in the first campaign. And after this you gotta play six more that feature the exact same ones with a different coat of paint. In the Homer level you're ramming the car for video games, but in the Marge level you're doing it for donuts. But in the Bart level you're doing it for roadkill. How innovative! Then there are the times when for some reason they lock progression behind a paywall. A virtual paywall that is, it's not like EM me at this. <laughs> Very early into the game, you'll start getting missions that are followed by a pop-up saying, Before you can do this task, you must go out and get the Plow King, or you must be wearing this specific outfit to proceed. And so now you've got to run around trying to scrounge up as much money as you can to continue playing. Now I understand why they did this, obviously it's a way to artificially extend the game length, but there's no predicting when these will come up, meaning I have no desire to spend my money any other time. You can find old Gil around the town, who will sell you optional cars if you want them, or you can go inside establishments to purchase extra costumes that are references to the show, like Homer's stonecutter outfit or Marge's police uniform, but why would I ever want to buy any of these cool costumes or cars? Because two seconds after spending all my money on one, I could come up to the next mission only for the game to say, sorry, you're not cool enough to proceed, you gotta go buy the cool Lisa outfit to try this mission, and now I've gotta spend another 30 minutes trying to get enough money to move on, despite the costumes affecting literally nothing in the mission. The game is nothing but fetch quests. Each mission is split up into smaller tasks, but these tasks are more often than not, Hey, can you help me? I'll help you if you help me with this. Go here and talk to this person. Hey. Hey person, can you help me? Sure, if you go over to this person. Hey, can you help me? No. Perfect! For anyone who hasn't played much of this game, I want to give you an exact idea of how monotonous this game can get at times. So I'm going to explain to you the entirety of the Lisa Swetson campaign to show you just how tedious it is. So you started off with Lisa trying to investigate the disappearance of her brother. So naturally she goes to the comic book store. And comic book guy says he'll help her if she helps him race a nerd to the itchy and scratchy store to get a comic book. So you do the race and get the comic book, then have to drive all the way back to his store. And comic book guy tells you he saw Bart at the Noiseland Arcade. As a player, we saw Bart get abducted, so we already know this is a waste of time, but we gotta go there anyway. Where we find Milhouse. Milhouse hits on Lisa, and then you have to follow his clues to find where Bart is. You then drive for about 15 seconds before running into Milhouse again, who tells you he saw Bart at the planet hype. So you travel all the way down there, where you yet again come across who else but Milhouse, who tells you Bart is actually at the Springfield sign. So you travel all the way across town to get there, like to remind you this is under a time limit and if you fail even one of these singular tasks, you restart all the way back at the arcade. But it doesn't even matter in the end, because Bart isn't here either. Lisa gives up and goes to ask Apu where he is. Apu will only help Lisa if she helps him retrieve some meat from Cletus and after this Apu tells Lisa to go and check with Frank at the observatory. Who tells Lisa that Bart was abducted by aliens and she for some reason wants to go and talk to Grandpa about it. Who tells Lisa to collect Bart's hat from a black van. You can only do this with the bus, which you have to buy from Otto for 300 coins, despite being able to destroy the vans just fine with any other car in previous levels. But whatever, you get the bus, destroy the vans, get Bart's hat, now you travel down to meet Chief Wiggum, who will only help you find Bart if you help him get evidence off Snake. You must be in disguise for some reason, so you have to travel to buy the cool lease outfit for 250 coins, hope you didn't spend all your money getting the bus one mission ago. You get the evidence, all is well, and Wiggum tells you to check the docks and ask the sea captain, who will, you guessed it, only help you if you help him first. Now you gotta collect a bunch of fish for him, 
Then he says he saw Bart in a black limo that you now have to destroy. Hope you like doing the same destroying mission again. You do this. Turns out he wasn't in the limo. He tells you he jumped out of the car and got in a boat. You drive onto the boat and finally after all this time, Bart is found. That was tedious just for me to explain. It's mostly just a bunch of fetch quests and it constantly seems like the goalpost is being moved. It doesn't make you feel like you're getting rewarded for accomplishing each mission. And these definitely get more and more infuriating as the game goes on. Some missions are really hard. Almost every task has a really tight time limit, and while it's good that it constantly keeps you on your toes, it's more stressful than anything. As you know, if you feel any one of these, you're sent all the way back to the beginning of the mission. This is definitely at its worst in the last stage. I get the last stage should be hard and all, but the ending here just feels so rushed like they were out of mission IDs and so it makes you do the exact same task three times in a row. You have to get a nuclear waste tank from the power plant, then travel all the way to the schoolyard to take it to the alien's tractor beam. Sounds simple enough. Well, each time you do this, it takes more and more time off your limit, until you only have one measly minute to travel across the entire town. Not to mention the waste is extremely fragile, so if you knock into anything, it will break and you have a time limit to travel back to the power plant for another, and while driving, it will start up more tasks within the tasks where you need to avoid and race cars until you finally defeat the aliens, the show is over, and Homer is now famous all across the galaxy. The end. Not the end for me though, I couldn't beat the final mission. Like five years ago I was able to do it no problem, but I guess that was just a fluke because for the life of me I cannot do this mission again. As a kid I may have had the time to retry a mission over and over again for hours, but I just do not have the patience for it anymore. Alright, uh, I was editing the video, the video's all done. I decided I'd play it, just beat it. What are you gonna do? And probably the most dated aspect of this game, the visuals. Translating The Simpsons into 3D is not an easy task. It was up until the recent Treehouse of Horror where I thought they finally managed to make them look halfway decent. I wouldn't mind seeing another Simpsons game in this style, but Hit and Run looks incredibly dated, even for a PS2 game. The models look ugly, for some reason Lisa goes up to Homer's neck, and while Springfield looks fine it is very boring and blocky. That's not even to mention how glitchy it is. Characters will clip through cars, the AI vehicles will screw you over a lot of the time, but I can almost forgive these as they're pretty funny to see happen. Like how sometimes you can kick a character and they fly off into orbit, or Milhouse showing off his incredible hiking abilities. Whoa, whoa, what's he doing? Whoa! Stand over there so I could do a mission, but like... Ryan, look out! What the fuck did you see the car hit us? <laughs> so in the end, after revisiting The Simpsons Hit and Run, would I call it overrated? Well, I guess it sort of depends on how you see the word overrated. Whether or not you personally enjoy something, I don't really think it's fair to call it overrated as it sort of implies that it's not deserving of its success or that there's something wrong with people liking it. Though I think Hit and Run is worthy of being considered one of the best games of its generation. Personally, no. But that's not to undermine how people view the game. If some think this game is amazing and love it to no end, then I can't really act like they're wrong for thinking so, or that I don't even see where they're coming from. But me not thinking it's amazing isn't to say it's bad. That's far from the truth. Overall, I think this game is pretty good. It's fun to control for the most part. It's full of references to a show I absolutely love. You can tell the writers had a great time making it as funny as they could, and simply driving around and exploring Springfield is a ton of fun. It's just too bad that I think it can be a tad tedious at times of its repetitive mission structure. I think this is the sort of game that could heavily benefit from a remake, it's got the perfect groundwork for an amazing game. I could have been given a lot more room to breathe in a sequel, but I'd take a remake too. They could fix up the graphics, make it less buggy, and if they want to go all out they could switch up the mission structure a bit to make it less repetitive. Or hey, they could just go for the Battle for Bikini Bottom approach and make it a one-for-one -one remake with no changes. People would still be satisfied with that. Who knows? With Spongebob's success, maybe we'll get a resurgence in licensed games. I'm sure the current owners will be down to make one if given the chance. Dude, who currently owns the license anyway? Or we could just play The Simpsons Tapped Out, that works too.